Good morning, church, and welcome to service on this 8th of November. I'm your music director, Kevin Nave, and I hope this morning finds you happy and healthy. If you would like to join me for our opening hymn, number 445 from our hymnal, Happy the Home When God is There, verses 1 and 4. I'm Reverend Cora. Let's pray as we seek to know God's presence during our worship this morning. We thank you, loving God, for calling us your children. It gives us such comfort to know that this is exactly what we are. Continue to work in and through us and draw us closer to you. Strengthen our faith, our hope, and our love so that when Jesus is revealed, we will be like him, and we will see him as he is. Gracious God, you call each of us by name and set us on this journey of life together. Grant that we will hear when you call us to new destinations and challenging possibilities. Give us the courage to follow the one you sent to lead us. Inspire us by the faithful testimony of that great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us. We pray through Jesus Christ, who is our way, our truth, and our life. Amen. Good morning, church. I'm Pastor Jack Manshrek. We want to let you know that everything that you could use to participate in today's service is available on our website, waterfordcumc.org. You'll find the order of worship, today's prayer list, message notes and devotions, as well as text for our scripture today. We send that out on Thursdays in an email, and if you'd like to receive that email, you can contact our church office to be added to that mailing list. I want to let you know about our Advent by Candlelight, which is going to be held virtually this year. Advent by Candlelight is an event we started last year where we gathered women of the church together to hear encouraging speakers and then to um, join with your friends for a refreshment afterwards. We want to try to keep that feeling as much as possible. So this year we're inviting hostesses to gather a small group of their friends over Zoom or another favorite way of yours to get together. And we'll provide you with a playlist of videos of music and speakers to watch with your friends. And then uh, also for the hostess, a guide of some questions and some prayers that you can say together. This is in hopes that you will be able to connect with God and with one another this Advent as we prepare our hearts for Christmas. If you'd like to be a hostess, or you would like to be invited to join one of these small events, you can sign up on the links that will be in our newsletter tomorrow morning or that you can find on our website. I hope that you will join us for this virtual transition of this fun event. We recognize that there are several of you who are joining us today that may have concerns or celebrations that you would like shared during our prayer time later in the service. If you want to text that celebration to the phone number that is provided uh, on the screen now, we can include those prayer requests in our time of prayer later in the service. We also recognize that there are some technological difficulties and we are working on that. 
but hang in there. Uh, the church lived a long time without technology like we use today, so we'll still get uh, to praise God today and hopefully enjoy each other's uh, presence. Friends, at the end of the service, please remember to record your worship attendance using the form on our website or the link in the comments section. Children, it's time to gather around for our children's message. Many of you know that this past week we had an election, and I had the joy of helping to count votes that came in by the mail or got dropped off at the drop box. Maybe you went with one of your parents to help submit their, um, their ballot by mail or in the drop box. It was my first time counting votes, and I was not alone. There were a lot of us who were there for the first time. But there were other people who had been there many times, and they knew what they were doing. We had to listen to the voices of the people who had experience so that we could do the counting process correctly and fast. If we hadn't listened to these experienced friends, we would have been there a lot longer than we were. Many things that we do have been done by other people before maybe by our parents, our grandparents, our teachers, or other adults around us, or even by our older siblings and friends. We can look to them to help give us guidance and help us know what to do better. The same is true with our faith. You might find yourself asking some questions about who God is and why we should go to church or why bad things happen. Do you ever have questions like that that come to your mind? The good news is you're not the first person to ask those questions. For thousands of years, people have been wondering questions just like yours. So when we have those questions, it can help to look up to people who have taken some time to think about them. Today, we are recognizing people who have been at our church for over 50 years. Wow! I bet these people have some experiences and knowledge that they could share with us. Some things that they have learned or a mistake that we might avoid. Maybe even though we're not together physically in this space, you can find a way to reach out to these 50-year members and thank them, perhaps asking them a question that they could share an answer to. In our Douglas Talks video that I'll share below in just a few minutes, we learn about how we rely on all people of faith to be the body of Christ. Let's say a prayer together. I'll start and you can repeat after me. Mysterious God, we have lots of questions. We are just kids. We are trying to figure this all out. We thank you for people with more experience to guide our faith and help us know you more. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Cora. <clears throat> we, uh, and thank you for your service in, in, in helping to count those votes, a very important uh, element of, of our uh, Christian discipleship. Friends, we want to uh, lift up a, a time of prayer, and we certainly want to uh, be with... Uh, uh, Marlene Noose and her family uh, as we recognize the passing of uh, Gary. Um, he died on uh, Tuesday this past week. He's been a member since 1976. Uh, his uh, service will be right here at Central Church in, in our uh, sanctuary at 10.30 a.m. Please mask up and come if you'd like to uh, be with uh, Marlene and the rest of the family. We have others for whom we are concerned we certainly want to lift up those who are suffering with uh, COVID-19. Uh, there's many folks who've been on our list. Uh, we do want to recognize that both Jerry and Paula Stevenson uh, now have been uh, diagnosed with it. Sandy uh, Krupa had uh, surgery this past week, removing screws from a previous uh, surgery. And so we want to keep Sandy in our prayers. Mary Landry was to have surgery, but it had to be uh, canceled or, or postponed because of uh, one of the staff 
uh, one of the doctors has COVID. We want to remember Glenn Robeson, who is now in rehab, has been in the hospital with COVID. We want to remember Rose Smith, who's having issues with her kidneys. Shirley Tyndall, who's been in the hospital, came home last Sunday. We want to keep Dwayne Solden in our prayers, who had surgery this past week. And then I just want to lift up uh, for us today, uh, Purple Threads is a magnificent group of uh, women who uh, study the scriptures, have uh, fellowship together, and pray for our church. Their prayer list is just as long as the one that we send out and uh, inclusive, and uh, we, I want to thank them for their many, many prayers. Uh, they pray for not only specific people, but they pray for the 12-step programs that we host in our church, for the community, uh, for our nation, and so I thank them for their prayers, which reminds me, let's pray for our nation as we are in this time of transition, and whatever it means for us, let us be mindful of something that a, a pastor friend of mine put on his Facebook this past week. Uh, even before the election, he, he said, I woke up this morning. He said, and Jesus was still Lord. So we recognize what it means to be a kingdom, of, a kingdom a citizen and a citizen of our United States as well. Let's pray. We 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 see from you demonstrated most vividly in Jesus' willingness to call us friends and then lay down his life for us. We are thankful for the experience uh, for the experience of Christ-like love through our church family, and we give thanks for those who have shaped our faith. We thank you for their sacrifices of time and personal freedoms. We are grateful for their caring compassions in times of illness and in times of sorrow. We thank you for those who taught us faith and shared with us the stories of Jesus. We thank you for their discipline, for the correction, for the correction that have molded our character, taught us respect and manners, and instilled in us values. We pray for those we've lifted up, those in need of physical healing, those who are searching for answers that lead to renewed health, relationships, and potential for an abundant life. We pray for our nation, and we pray for our world. We thank you that you are present to each of us and that in you we can find the, the perfect love and acceptance that we so deeply desire. Guide us to share that love and acceptance with others. We pray for this through Christ our Lord and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, join me in the prayer that Christ taught us, the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Ruth, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you, so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman Boaz, with whose young woman you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. She said to her, All that you tell me, I will do. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you who is more to you than seven sons has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The woman of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. 
They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The message, we want to uh, recognize our 50-year celebration. We, uh, this is Founders Day. We want to uh, commemorate those who are on this list of those who have been members of our church family for 50 plus years. It's a long list. It uh, has 45 people on it, and you can do the math, but that's uh, hundreds of years of service, hundreds of years of service uh, here, at our, uh, here at Central United Methodist Church. We have five new uh, uh, members that we are five new members to this uh, 50 year list, and we want to congratulate them. We want to congratulate Bruce and Kathy Hazen, who've been with us for 50 years. They've been very involved in the missions of this church, as well as uh, Kathy's been uh, a member of many different uh, uh, committees at the conference level. We want to thank uh, Roger and Julia Crick, who have been uh, members of our church for a long time. Uh, for, for that 50 years, and Phyllis Liming. I want to tell you something about Phyllis Liming. She has also been uh, the leader of our Caring Core Ministries, writing notes of encouragement. Uh, she has led that effort for over 20 years. When I visited these folks, I had marvelous conversations, and uh, when I visited Phyllis, we talked, uh, keeping our distance, uh, wearing our mask, and uh, she asked me if I would bring... Uh, two uh, prayer shawls that she <laughs> knitted during this pandemic time. I think you can see them. Uh, they've, uh, they've been in our background for a bit. Uh, those prayer shawls will go to people that uh, we want them to know that they are in our prayers. And there is a prayer that is a part of that. And so I'm going to, uh, it's actually a little poem, but I'm going to read it to you. And then let's pray uh, for these new members of our uh, Founders Day of uh, 50 plus years. And then let's, uh, uh, and then we'll go on to the message. Uh, no farther than a prayer. I wrap the prayers of warmth and love around your weary frame, praising, thanking God for the gift of you as I pray your name. Every stitch sends forth a plea that joy will fill your soul, and on the needles and as the needles fly, making a pattern of prayer gold. The shawl takes on a holiness, for prayer is wrapped inside. It is so soft and warm, a place where you can hide. So as you wrap the shawl around, may you feel my presence there. I may not sit beside you, but I'm no farther than a prayer. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, friends, let's pray. Gracious God, we want to thank you for the generations that have gone before us and those who still lead us in this life, those who have been members of our church for 50 years and, and serve as a, a wonderful example of your presence in their lives, your presence in the life of this church, and that they inspire us, no matter how long we've been a member of this church. They show us a way of discipleship, a way of being in ministry that is meaningful, and we thank you. Uh, for their many years of service. Gracious God, we ask for a blessing upon them as we ask for a blessing upon our church. In the name of Christ our Lord and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.
Friends, I'm not quite sure what happened with our pitcher uh, earlier in the service, but I have to tell you, I'm going to get a little emotional here. We have the best tech team in the world, and uh, <laughs> they were running around, talking to each other. I mean, literally running to the back of the sanctuary, making sure that we could uh, resolve this. And I want to thank, uh, oh, there they are. There's the tech team. Oh, well, no, there's me. <laughs> Sometimes your sanctuary becomes a, a production studio, and uh, we have to just work with the technology that we have, and I want to thank Rustin for his, uh, thank God he's a sprinter and a runner so that he can uh, uh, you know, do that and uh, make things happen. I don't know what switches had to be switched, but we made it work. God bless you guys. Thank you. Uh, take out your message notes, follow along, whatever you'd like to do with that. There's five days of devotional material there for you to unpack throughout this week. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <laughs> Throughout the, the scriptures, friends, uh, it's mentioned how the people of God are to relate to one another, and uh, it often is within the context of family. When God in our scripture wants to teach us something about family, scripture often message, mentions the relationship between Christ and the church. Conversely, when God in our scriptures wants us to know something about Christ and the nature of the church, scripture often talks about family. There are many references of brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul wrote that we are children of God, adopted children, but children nonetheless. And because we are God's children, then we are heirs to life eternal. Christ is referred to as the groom and the, the church as his bride. Hello, <laughs> we, we recognize and call God Father. We also recognize that there are wonderful uh, feminine uh, images of our God as a loving mother. Actually, in the scriptures, uh, the original language, that term for, for that we say father, is daddy. Oh, daddy. Uh, every, every once in a while, my 28-year-old daughter will still call me daddy, and it just warms my heart. Um, my sons don't so much call me daddy, but that's just something else. But all this is to say that we are the church. And as the church, as followers of Christ, we are given some expectations on how we should relate to each other. Our mission statement, central church, connecting with God, connecting with others, changing our world with Christ's love, recognizes the relationships that should be primary in our lives. We recognize the value of relationships, the value of being a family, brothers and sisters in Christ. This is a, a wonderful expectation for ourselves as we together experience God's guidance and, and our, of our ministry and then in turn bless God's name as we worship and praise God. However, it does raise a question or two in my mind. Of course, I would want to, to know what those expectations uh, from, from, uh, are from a biblical perspective. And secondly, I would like to know just how seriously do we embrace the concept of the church's family? Besides the many references of family in our scriptures, there are some wonderful illustrations of family that can provide for us a glimpse of how we should relate to each other. The book of Ruth uh, provides some wonderful insights on how family operates, and I believe for how the church might best function as a family. The story of Ruth is four chapters, uh, about three and a half pages in most Bibles, and it begins with the Jewish man Elimelech, who took his wife and two sons from their home, uh, in Bethlehem to Moab because there was a famine in the land. His wife's name was Naomi and their son's names were Malon and Chilion. And while in Moab, Elimelech dies. The two sons had, had married Moabite women. One was named Orpah and the other one was Ruth. And then the two sons, Malon and Chilion, each died. So there they are, three widows, uh, the matriarch of a family and, and, uh, and these two daughter-in-laws and she's in a foreign land. Without saying too much, a woman in ancient Middle East was not the most valued of people. A widow past childbearing age had no social status at all. She was totally dependent on either her son's generosity or her husband's family. And when food was scarce, widows could be turned out into the street. That would be uh, to a family's shame, but it happened. That's why there are so many commandments and New Testament instructions to take care of widows and orphans. They were completely dependent on the generosity of others. 
And interestingly enough, it it is the widow beyond childbearing year who is heroic in her actions to pack up and head back for Judah, back to the bosom of the Jewish people. And it appears that Naomi is going to take her two daughter-in-laws with her, remembering that the two daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth, are dependent on their husband's family as well, even if that family was simply their widowed mother-in-law. But before leaving Judah, Naomi tells her daughter-in-laws to return to their homes, the home of their own mothers, because there is no future for them in a foreign land. Orpah returned to her home, but Ruth clinged to Naomi. No matter how much Naomi insists that Ruth return to her family, Ruth responded, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people uh, shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, even if death parts me from you. As it turns out, Ruth was just as insistent as Naomi. The two travel to Judah and there they run across the kinsmen of Elimelech and Naomi begins to think about how she's going to provide for this daughter-in-law Ruth as well as herself. The kinsman Boaz had already met and taken notice of Ruth and Naomi took notice of that notice. And in our scripture for this morning, we begin to see Naomi's plan uh, unfold. She tells Ruth to wash up and anoint herself and to put on her best clothes because she's going to have a rendezvous with Boaz. Uh, Please understand that Naomi isn't instructing Ruth to doll up for a a rather clandestine meeting with a man in the middle of the night. Washing and anointing and putting on sweet-smelling oils and, and dressing your best symbolize either the end of a period of mourning or it's preparation for a bride of a wedding. In my opinion, it's not a question of either or. I believe Naomi is saying, time, it's time to stop crying for our losses, and it's time for hope and blessing. It's time for a party. And the party that Naomi has in mind is a wedding. <laughs> the second portion of our scripture reading from the book of Ruth tells us that, in fact, Boaz did take Ruth as his wife, and not only that, she had a son by Boaz, and not just any son. They named a son Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was then the father of King David. Ruth, an outsider from the Jewish faith, is part of the lineage of the the greatest king of all Jewish history, David. Subsequently, Ruth is part of the lineage of Jesus. It's a great story. It's a great story with two major themes— First, beware of the stranger in our midst, the outsider, for his or her importance, his or her uh, being may be more than just meets the eye. Imagine a foreign widow becoming the great-grandmother of King David. It's great reminders to us that people who are new to us, stranger to us, can be of great value in our community. A second thing we should be aware of is the full redemption that is possible through God's great mercy. The hand of God is written all over this narrative. The very notion of a widow in a foreign land returning to Judah with a widowed daughter-in-law, securing for her a husband and bearing a son in the lineage of a king is almost preposterous. But with God, anything is possible. All things are possible. I see several challenges to the church today in this little story of Ruth tucked away in our Hebrew scriptures. First and foremost is the value of the outsider. Consider those who are our guests uh, who come to our church. uh, Their gifts and graces are present to us. Too many times the guest, the stranger I missed, has has, uh, proven to be the answer to prayer. I will never forget, I've told this story before, I'll never be forget being in the midst of a building program at a very difficult juncture in the process of, of, uh, of that uh, building process. And you know who God sent to us? None other than an architect who, who created a beautiful uh, building for us. Uh, an architect who offered his ability and got us back on track for that project. In our story of Ruth, the outsider teaches us a second great lesson. Family is family. Ruth, although not her blood relative, made a commitment, and a commitment she kept. Family at its best sticks together and supports each other through thick and thin. This is where the church's family has always gotten to me. 
through difficult times, the church's family doesn't always stick together, supporting each other. And sometimes it's easier to walk away and sometimes it's easy to watch others walk away. This is why one of my questions comes to mind, how seriously do we take the concept of family in the church? A third lesson we can learn from the book of Ruth is, is the concept of seeking the security for one another. Naomi sought the security for her daughter-in-law, and some scholars would say that she, she sought her own security in doing so, and it's the same with the church. Back to the major theme of the outsider. How much do we seek their security? How welcomed are they? How do we make them feel safe in our midst? How do we allow them to express themselves and utilize their gifts for ministry within the context of our church? Here's the beauty in seeking their security. We ensure our own security as well. The church will only last for as long as we welcome others into it. We stop welcoming the outsider and seeking his or her security, then we stop existing. Fourth, we should consider the guidance Naomi provided for Ruth. The world looks to the church for guidance and how often we let the world down. Those who come into our fellowship need to be guided in the faith and, and the, that would be their faith, their security. Finally, there, there is the issue of redemption. Naomi was of the redeemed people of Israel. Ruth said that Naomi's people would be her people and Naomi's God would be her God. The redeemed of God is an open family. There's always room for one more or 20 more or 100 more or thousands more. The family was important during Jesus' day and is important to us now. During Jesus' day, the family functioned as the basic unit of religious community preserving past traditions, passing them through instruction and worship within the home. It's only fitting that the religious institution of the Church of Jesus Christ functions as a family in the best possible sense, in ways that we find in our scripture for today. I titled this sermon, All in the Family, not because we keep all the things in the family, but because all are welcomed into the family of God. And friends, that's the word of God. For the people of God today at Central Church, I hope you find it helpful. I offer it in the name of our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, we're going to receive an offering now. Central is a member-supported organization, so your tithes and offerings go to support the ongoing operations, missions, and ministries of this church. I want to thank the many of you who have sent in your tithes and offerings throughout this pandemic. If you want to continue to give, we encourage you to do so. We're also thankful for those of you who've made uh, generosity pledges for next year, ensuring the future of Central Church. I encourage others to follow up with that, uh, uh, filling in those generosity cards. As I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that they all have gotten out to you by now. If you want to continue to give, there's also a way to give through uh, electronic means and through texting. Again, thank you for your generosity. Let's enjoy the beautiful offertory that June has prepared. Let's pray. Oh God, these gifts we offer were never ours to begin with. You are the giver of every good gift, our talents, our treasures, and our lives. Accept these gifts we offer as testimonies of our love for you uh, and our desire to serve you. In our giving, we make a declaration. Our lives are in your hands. We affirm our desire to be bold in our discipleship, not hiding our talents uh, in the ground or under a basket, but afraid and afraid to risk, but daring to be children of light, ministering in your name to the poor, to the broken of this world. We offer that ministry 
We offer our lives as we offer these gifts in the name of Jesus, the light of the world. Amen. Friends, as I've already said, I went out this past week to take some pictures of our newest 50-year members, and it was a delight. I kept my distance, wore my mask, sanitized my hands often. I'm incredibly aware, and I became incredibly aware in that little jaunt. That's how I spent my Wednesday of this past week, uh, part of it anyway. And, and uh, I'm aware of the, the need for human touch, for human presence to one another. Having said that, I cannot in good conscience open our sanctuary for in-person worship at this time. It was the plan to begin meeting in person in our sanctuary next week, November 15th. But with the increase, the doubling of numbers of new cases and increase in deaths, schools now shutting down and returning to completely virtual instruction, and with our own church family being impacted with at least six cases this past few weeks, more actually, it would be foolish to open up. I've been tested four times throughout this pandemic with rapid testing sites and a couple times through the Red Cross when I've given blood. Uh, I'm very careful with my visits, uh, meeting with people, keeping them short, I understand, is, is, a, is a great part of that, conducting funerals and just being in public. I believe that our members who had COVID were also careful. We just don't know where we might be exposed to this pandemic virus. So we're back to our until further notice status and opening our building. And your staff, our staff is working hard to create uh, worship services for the holidays. We are in mourning because Christmas Eve is a wonderful and beautiful time for the church. But we're going to create some worship services that we hope that you will take the time from the safety of your home, gathered with others, uh, with whom you are sheltering at home and, and enjoy those services that we will be producing. If we can open up sometime during that holidays, we will. But right now, we are until further notice. So in the meantime, friends, let's stay connected as, as, as best as possible because we are called to be a family, God's people, seeking the security of one another as well as seeking our own security. Be blessed, my church family. God loves you, and so do I. Please raise your voices with me one more time for our closing hymn, number 92, For the Beauty of the Earth, verses 1 and 4. We are called to belong, not just to believe. We are called to be joined together, bound together, held together, fitted together, members together, one with each other, together in Christ. Let us go in peace in the name of our loving creator, redeemer, and sustainer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.